thank you all for showing up on your Friday. I know you have other things you could definitely be doing, uh, like in the way to wherever you're gonna go to for the weekend. Uh, but I definitely thank you all for showing up. Uh, my talk on anti-Christian bias in academia and beyond really isn't based on one work, it's based on several pieces of work that I've been working on. Some of it's been published, some of it's going to be published, and one, and I'll point out this article, is under review somewhere. So that's what it's based upon. So it's not just one piece of work, it's several pieces of work. Uh, we've heard, if you pay attention to the popular debates of the day, you hear things such as liberal bias or, or, or things of this nature as concerns academia. And a lot of times what you get is you'll get an anecdotal evidence. You'll get you know, some people saying, well, this happened to me or that, that happened to me. And as a scholar, my interest is more than just what would happen as far as an individual situation, but what happens systematically. And so I became interested in the whole issue of bias in academia and you know, possible effects. And a lot of my research, uh, more recent research, has really focused in on that question. Now, when you hear the, bi the whole talk about bias, uh, a lot of times people are dressed up in like this. The religious makeup in academia, they point out factors like this. That only 7% of the members of the National Academy of Sciences have a personal belief in a deity. Now, roughly speaking, 75 to 80% of Americans do, so that's a big underrepresentation. Or they point out something like this that only 2.9% of academics at elite universities are conservative Protestants. Generally speaking, conservative Protestants are about 30% of the country. Once again, well underrepresented. Now, this is used to show that, all right, there's a bias in academia against religious Christians. But that's incorrect. Because there's something called self-selection. It may be, and it, it's very viable that conservative Christians are less likely to choose to go into academia. There have been some theories why this may be the case. It may be that conservative Christians are less intellectually curious. It may be that they prefer jobs that are better paying. And as a professor, I can tell you, yeah, that's a good reason not to go into academia. Uh, but so, so there are reasons why Christians may not go into academia. To really show that there's an issue, you can't just look at numbers like this and say, look, they're underrepresentation. What you have to do is you have to look at the whole process. And that's what I wanted to do. So several years ago, I did some research, and that research ended up in a book called Compromise and Scholarship, and that book's out right now, where I want to look at the question on, is there any sort of bias for people going in academia? And one of the things I wanted to look at then was whether or not people have a bias towards those who apply for a job in academia. But this is a question I sent out to several disciplines. This question is, assume that your faculty, that your faculty is hiring new, a new professor. Below is a list of possible characteristics of the new hire. That list included a lot of different factors, political groups, religious groups, lifestyle groups, uh, age groups, sexuality groups, uh, about 26 groups, okay? Many of them are characteristics that you cannot directly inquire of a prospective candidate. However, if you are able to learn these characteristics about a candidate, would that make you more or less likely to support their hire? Please rate your attitude on a scale in which one indicates that the characteristic greatly damages your support for a candidate, four is that the characteristic does not make a difference, and seven indicates that the characteristic greatly enhances your support to hire the candidate. If you do not understand the characteristic, then please indicate such with the not applicable. So basically what I want to go know is, all right, if you learn this about this person, does it make you more or less likely to hire them, or does it not matter at all? And I would argue that all 26 characteristics should not have mattered. They did not, and one of the characteristics was not as a high school dropout. That would matter. I found out someone applying for a job in our department is a high school dropout. Um, that greatly damages my willingness to hire them. There were not characteristics that really should have mattered. The question is, did they? I asked several disciplines, eight uh, religious characteristics. And here's what I found. This is the percentage of people who said that the characteristics damaged their willingness to hire them. Now, some said slightly, some said moderately, some said greatly. All right? And 
for simplicity right now, I'm, I'm putting it all together, which I know is not completely fair, but it makes it easier to present it. Uh, you can see the different disciplines here. Sociology, of course, I'm going to do my own discipline. Uh, political science, anthropology, physics, chemistry, English language, philosophy. I wanted to have some of the uh, humanities, the soft sciences, and some of the hard sciences. And there are some differences there which we could talk about later if you wish. And you can see the different religions. Uh, atheists, which is not technically a religion, but it's a religious belief. Catholics, evangelical, fundamentalist, Jew, mainline, Mormon, Muslim. The key is, look at the uh, spike with evangelicals and fundamentalists. Uh, you know, Mormons, the spike is not nearly as pronounced. That's an indication of a high percentage of individuals who say, if I find out you're an evangelical or a Mormon, I'm less likely to be willing to hire you. Some slightly, some moderately, some, some greatly. Uh, the, the numbers, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, for uh, the disciplines of English and anthropology, it's over 60% for, uh, fundamental, um, for fundamentalists and it's uh, almost 60% for evangelicals. And in fact, when I average all of these together, which for various reasons is not a complete understanding of academia in general, uh, I found that about 50% of the respondents said they're less willing to hire someone if they find out they're a fundamentalist, and about 40% if they're an evangelical. So two out of every five academics, if they find out a candidate is an evangelical Christian, that fact by itself makes them less willing to hire that person. Some of them only slightly, but some of y'all I know have been on search committees, and sometimes you have two very closely matched candidates, and that slightly can matter. Now, a person may say fairly that really, you know, these religious categories are proxies for political beliefs. It's not that I don't want to hire the fundamentalist or evangelical, but they tend to be politically conservative. And in fact, in other research I've done, I've shown that a lot of people take Christianity and they say Christianity equals Republican. You know, not, not true, but that's what they say. So I took out the four lowest scores of the religious groups and I put in four political groups, Republican, NRA member, Democrat, ACLU member. And it is true that being a Republican and an NRA member does not help you. But you can see that it does not hurt you as much, once again, as the evangelical or fundamentalist. So my conclusion is that this is not merely a political bias. And in fact, I will be honest, I thought there was going to be more of a political bias than a religious bias when I first did this work. Because there is actually, in my discipline, a group of Christian sociologists. There is no group of Republican sociologists as a group. So I actually thought the, re the political bias would be greater. I was wrong. It's the religious bias that is greater. So this is uh, a component. And, if, and we think about it, if people are less willing to hire people because of their religious beliefs, are they also less willing? And I, you know, I, I haven't studied this, but we have to be reasonable. Are they also less willing to give them tenure? Are they also less willing to publish an article or, or give, them a, give them a grant if they find out about their religious background? You know, we have to be reasonable about what we're seeing here. So given this now, we know that this is here, but why and what's behind that? And here's where some other work that I've done may come into play. To understand this work, we have to first understand that academics tend to be culturally progressives. And what I mean by culturally progressives is on issues such as abortion, homosexuality, academics tend to be very progressive on those issues. They tend to be progressive overall, but they're even more culturally progressive than progressive overall. Uh, from Rothman, we see that 84% of academics are pro-choice, including 51% of academics who are Republicans. So among those who are Republicans, 51% of them are pro-choice. Uh, they find that 81% of academics see homosexuality as acceptable as heterosexuality, including 25% of Republicans. And they find out that academics are more likely to support abortion and homosexuality, or more likely to work at elite colleges and universities. So the ones who support the most work at the more powerful places. So in thinking about what's happening, one of the things that I come to the conclusion is we've got to look at the culture of cultural progressives to get a better understanding of why academics have these sort of barriers that they have for religious individuals. Well, to do, 
to do that, I uh, did a survey of cultural progressives. And out of that survey of open-ended questions, I found a group that appeared to have a more intense dislike for conservative Christians. And a book I have coming out next year called uh, Too Many Christians, Not Enough Lions addresses that. But to illustrate the sort of impact of some of their sayings, I want to, uh, I want to uh, do a little thought experiment. Now imagine I was studying not uh, a, a group of cultural progressives, but a church, a large church. And uh, assume that I did a survey and I got 2,500 respondents, open-ended questions, I asked them questions about Jews. And assume then that I got these responses in my open-ended questions. Okay. Uh, my favorite bumper sticker, so many Jews, so few ovens. Bring back the ovens. None of ovens. They've abandoned their Jewish views for a political position. I wish we could start putting them in ovens again or burn them at the stake. Fill the ovens. Put them in the ovens. So many Jews, so few ovens. If I got this many comments, out, even out of 2,500 people, I would come to the conclusion this church has a problem with anti-Semitism. Not that everyone in the church is anti-Semite, but having this people willing to say these things on a survey would tell me that this is a, that's a problem in that church. Well, I didn't study a church. I studied cultural progressives. And I had about 2,500 responses. I didn't get these responses. Here's what I got. My favorite bumper sticker, so many Christians, so few lions. Bring back the lions. Not enough lions. They've abandoned their Christian views for a political position. I wish you could start feeding them to lions again or burn them at the stake. Feed the lions. Feed them to the lions. And so many Christians, so few lions. These are actual statements that I got when I did the open-ended questions. Uh, so if we were to say that that church, that mythical church, has a problem with anti-Semitism, then we would have to say that among this group of cultural progressives that there is a problem here on a certain hostility towards Christians. Now, a person can easily say, well, that's a few out of 2,500. But these are the ones that concern lions. In fact, at one point I was reading the data, I was like, what's this thing about lions? You know, I mean, where did this all come from? Uh, but that's not the only ones that I have. And since we're looking at academics, I wanted to look at academics who only had graduate degrees. So out of those, uh, I found some other sayings. Uh, I abhor him, them and wish we could do away with them. I'd be giddy, certain grateful if everyone who saw his or herself in that category were snatched permanently from our social peripheries, whether by Holocaust, rapture, or plague. We'd like to give them all a frontal lobotomy. May they come to an unhappy end. I want them all to die in a fire. The only good Christian is a dead Christian. And someone who has studied race and ethnicity like me knows the context of that quote. They may be a believer in the eugenics. They pollute good air. I would be in favor of establishing a state for them, if not sterilize them so they can't breed more. So this is the context then that we're seeing. Now, seeing this context and going back to my findings on uh, academics and willing to hire evangelicals, fundamentalists, now we're beginning to see it making a little bit more sense why that is there. Last year, uh, I took the, we took the data on just cultural progressives in general, and we had a book called What Motivates Cultural Progressives? And those quotes, you know, are among some of those respondents, but really in general, what sort of stereotypes emerge from quotes like these? I mean, why, is, why this hostility is there? And uh, so there are certain stereotypes these cultural progressives had of Christians. For example, there are stereotypes that Christians want theocracy. They, they talk uh, about how there's a fear that, well, Christians take over, they're going to set up these theocracy laws. Uh, ignorance, that Christians don't know very much. Uh, hypocrites, childish. They also talk a lot about children being led by leaders. That was a common theme. Backwards culture talking about being brought back to the dark ages. Uh, racist, sexist, homophobic, you know, the isms as you, know, you might want to call it. It was more the uh, sexist and homophobic than the racist, but the racist was definitely there. Anti-science and cannot quickly think. Now, the last two, for the sake of time, you know, 
I'll only look at the last two uh, because I think those are the most pertinent to explaining what we saw early in, in the book Compromise and Scholarship. So uh, I once again went through the data and just picked out a few quotes to illustrate what I mean by anti-science. Its political involvement is damaging our body politics, its narrow-mindedness, anti-science stance is damaging our educational uh, systems. Anti-evidence, anti-science, and anti-rational approach to complex problem world and complex problems. And one more. Uh, this person says they're anti-science, anti-reason, anti-evolution, and often anti-common sense. They claim outmoded beliefs in spite of all evidence, scientific or otherwise. So this was a fairly common theme. Notice I'm sticking once again with people with graduate degrees because we're talking about academics. Uh, I don't know whether these people are in academia. I didn't ask them questions on where they worked. But we can see this is a common theme. You know, this is a common stereotype that to be Christian is equated as being anti-science, anti-rational, anti-reasoning. And also, uh, critical thinking abilities. Uh, I tend to view them as uneducated people or those who don't have the capacity for critical thinking, perhaps driven by fear. They also feel the need for some sort of birthright, something they feel they've inherited. And then another one, this group does not make evidence-based decisions, so reasoning with them is typically not possible. The critical thinking skills are usually under non-developed, so having any sort of discussion with them is often unproductive. <coughs> I find myself biased against Christians. I think that they are dumb and find it very difficult to listen politely to Christian chatter. It annoys me. So basically, what we have is this image of Christians, at least these last two, anti-science, can't, can't talk with them because they can't use reason, they can't engage in critical thinking. And if these are your stereotypes and you're on a search committee and, some, and you find out, of course you can't ask someone, but you find out someone is a conservative Protestant and this is how you think of conservative Protestants, probably going to be less likely to hire them. And so this is part of the barriers that, that is there. So uh, does this matter? Does this matter in the way academics is done? Now, I'm a sociologist, and as such, I, I can speak more for the social sciences. You know, I, I can't speak for the, uh, the hard sciences. You know, maybe it matters in ways that are subtle. Maybe it doesn't matter. I'm not certain. But I can say that I've seen research that I think is, is affected by this bias. Let me show you a little bit of the research that I think is affected by this bias and, the implica and the, one of the implications of it. Christians and intelligence. One would think that, given these sort of stereotypes, that a person is going to find out, uh, if you have those sort of biases, when you do research on intelligence and religion, that people who are religious are going to be less intelligent. And in fact, uh, Lynn et al. finds that IQ tests possibly correlate with levels of atheism on a rational level. So the higher the levels of atheism, the higher the IQ tests. And because uh, of finds that Christians are less intelligent than atheists with uh, research in the United States. And Ultermeyer finds that Christians with high levels of right-wing authoritarianism tend to believe logical fallacies. One would expect these sort of findings. Now, are these findings accurate? Well, some of you probably remember, uh, some of you look old enough, some of you maybe not quite old enough to remember the bell curve. That about 15, 20 years ago, there's a book that came out called The Bell Curve. And The Bell Curve basically, and I never read the book so I'm going on what, what other people said. But there's a basic argument that the reason why African Americans and Hispanics weren't doing well was they weren't as intelligent. And uh, the bell curve got panned in academia. And the major argument against it, among other arguments, was that IQ tests are culturally constructed and that they're not a good measure for looking at racial differences. And in fact, if you look at Lynn, you probably could find IQ tests positively correlate with the percentage of Europeans and European Americans in the country, too. So the question you have to ask then is, OK, is there something within these sort of measures that might be creating these sort of results? And so I wanted to challenge this. And I looked at the last study by Altemeyer, and I found out that he used, uh, of a list of statements, four major statements where Christians scored lower when it came to dealing with logical fallacies. As I look at these statements, I, I realized why. There were statements that had certain assumptions in them that Christians were more likely to make than non-Christians. So I questioned, well, what if there are different assumptions with different statements, so assumptions that atheists would be more likely to make? Would atheists do a better job? Because according to this research, they're more logical. So the way the statements are set up is, you know, agree or disagree, uh, one to seven scale. 
And, uh, and then, you know, you give the statements and then you mention how confident you are you agree or disagree. And basically, using uh, logic, if alternatives are possible, you can't say you logically prove something. Now, you can say that, log you know, logically that I'm not halfway across the campus because that's, that's not an alternative. I'm right here. You know, I have all these witnesses. So if something happens, you know, some murder across the campuses, you all my alibi. Uh, can you say, can you all say that, you know, well, logically you, uh, you drove uh, from your house and didn't know because you don't know and there may be an alternative. Maybe I came from Fort Worth, something like that. If there's a possibility, then you can't say you've proven it. Well, here's the, statement, here's the statements that I used in the research that I did. And uh, for a sake of time, we'll, I'll just go into them. So this first statement, just because there's many religions in the world have legends of a big flood does not prove the story of Noah, the Bible is true. That's, that's true. You know, uh, there could be other reasons why those stories uh, are there. Maybe the Noah account is only partially correct. Uh, maybe there was a flood in certain parts of the world. Uh, there's alternatives to that. So that, that would be a true statement. That's the one that Altamire used. Uh, the second statement, the overwhelming evidence for evolution proves the, that the Christian's assertions about God creating the world are false. Well, that is not true because evolution says how we've gotten here, but not why. Uh, the, evolution does not prove that God does not direct evolution. Uh, you know, evolution is not uh, an evidence that God did not create the world. I mean, think about it. evolution is about biological creatures, not about the world. So that is obviously a false statement. Uh, the fact that uh, archaeologists have discovered a fallen wall the site of ancient Jericho does not prove the story of the Bible about Joshua and the horns. And that is true. The wall could have fallen for many reasons. You know, someone had, uh, you know, uh, had allergies and they blew it down. Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it could have fell. All right? Uh, psychology and sociological explanations for why people believe in religion proves that worshiping God is driven by natural human needs instead of a supernatural deity. That is false. It's possible that us sociologists can explain worship and that there's a supernatural, or those explanations could, just could be wrong. All right, we got a few more. The existence of tragedies such as the Holocaust proves that there's not a loving God that cares for us, and that is false. I mean, tragedies, uh, there may, the way that statement is written, and maybe God's not powerful enough to prevent them, or, and those of you who dabble with theology know, that there's, there's the argument about human choice. You know, to stop the Holocaust, God may have to actually take away our human choice. So that is a false statement. Uh, the accounts of many people who nearly died, who say they traveled through a dark tunnel towards an all living being of light, proves the teaching of Christianity is true, and that is false. There may be a common uh, physiological phenomenon. Uh, there, 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 it may be of another religion. Uh, once again, there's alternatives. I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm just saying there's alternatives. Therefore, that is not a true statement. All right, uh, research has suggested that people who pray for better health are not any healthier than those who do not pray at all. Other research shows that people who pray for financial assistance are not more likely to become wealthier than those who do not pray. Yet this does not prove there's no God who will answer prayers. And that is true. It may be God answers certain types of prayers or slightly answers prayers. So there are, there are alternatives. And then finally, uh, the fact that the Shroud of Terran was scientifically shown to have been made in the Middle Ages indicate that it was a fake, not a mirac miraculous impression made by God. And that would be true. The Shroud of Terran was made in the Middle Ages. Obviously, it was not back there in Jesus' time. Okay. So these were on my questionnaire. Go ahead. And the way I scored it is anyone did a four, neither did green, neither did smart, wrong, because all of them had answers. Uh, I only marked, I mean, I did this dichotomously for the chart you're going to see. Uh, maybe you should argue, well, if you really know it, you should have the high score of seven or low score of one. But I only marked whether you got agree or disagree, so that that makes it a little bit easier to understand. Uh, and, you, you know, I've already gone through these. Go to the second one. You know, one, three, seven, eight is correct, and two, four, five, six, disagree is correct. Let's go ahead and go to the chart. What I found is what you expect to find if our biases rule today. The first four, you can see Christians are more likely to get correct. Those were the four that I created that had biases that favored Christians and did not favor atheists. The last four were the ones Altmaier used. And sure enough, 
the atheists were more likely to get that one correct, those ones correct. What this suggests to me is when we use examinations for intelligence that are culturally constructed, if we don't take into consideration the cultural background, we're going to get false positives uh, all the time. And this, it, given the context of the research and the context of the attitudes that I've demonstrated, this is why we have out there in the sciences today arguments that Christians are less intelligent than non-Christians. I don't have any evidence to show that they're, they're not, but my, my assumption is, given on this research, this little research, which is under review right now, uh, the chances are Christians are, are about as intelligent or non-intelligent as everyone else. Uh, I can't say that I've proven that, but I, I think that if we get studies that are balanced, that's what we are going to find. Okay, does this matter? I mean, this talks about anti-Christian uh, attitudes in academia and beyond. I think it does matter. I think it matters in our larger society. A few years ago, I did some research where I documented animosity towards religious groups uh, and uh, documented towards Christians as well. And certain people ha are more likely to have, have that animosity. Whites actually are more likely to have animosity towards Christians. And this is an interesting because if you look, you know, we think of African Americans as being progressives, and they are. But most African American progressives still don't favor separation of church and state. I mean, think about the tradition of African American progressivism, Martin Luther King and, and Nat Turner and people who are religious. Uh, and so whites are actually more likely to have animosity towards Christians than non-whites. Uh, the educated are, uh, go ahead, uh, people on the West Coast. So I may not take that job at UCLA after all. Uh, political progressives. Uh, you know, whites is a, is a so unique case. I think the last three are probably individuals more likely to uh, use ac academic knowledge, scientific knowledge, to get their understanding about society, to get, to get their understanding about, you know, if we're in a cultural war. And so that's not surprising. And then this last one's not surprising at all. People who th say religion is not important are also more likely to have animosity towards Christians. So I do think there's a larger impact in the rest of our society. And it's something worth paying attention to. So my conclusion in this sort of whirlwind of quickly going through all this is this. Uh, I would argue that we need more Christians in academia working to overcome these biases. I mean, this is a call for Christians who feel called to come into academia and to work in there. I mean, it's what I've done. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be easy for anyone to get a doctorate degree. Uh, and you could argue it may even be harder for Christians, but I think that's something that has to be done. I think the more you have contact with people who are different from you, the more accepting you become. And I think there's a, there's a problem of acceptance, as I think my first few slides show. But Christians should not fool themselves into thinking that it's, you know, that's going to be completely fair. You know, it's not impossible, and, I, and never tell anyone you can't do it, but also be realistic. So, that's what I conclude from this. Thank you for your time.